the Building Live Through Sports Network podcast sits down with international sports expert, Dr. Lisa Anthony, founder and CEO of Building Live Through Sports Network, as she touches on international conversations converging everyday life and its associations and relationship to sports. In a gauge dialogue for the betterment of those who have worked, are working, and will come to work in the sports world. to the Building Lives Through Sport Network podcast. This is our first one, and we're very excited today because we have Ricardo Dickerson. He is a um, former football player from the Baltimore, Maryland area, and he has taken the time to go overseas abroad and work with student athletes. And not only just work with them like in camps like you would usually see when you go overseas, but he has taken the time to bring them back to further their education and help them to achieve um, success as a student athlete here in the United States. And he stays in touch with them, and we're so excited to have him with us here today. So welcome, Ricardo. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to be with us today on our first uh, podcast podcast anytime I, when I you know to get the opportunity to, to to be with the goat of the international game I mean I, I could I had to be the first one and I, I'm super excited and just happy to be here with you oh thank you so much the goat of international uh, football absolutely <laughs> well you know Baltimore Maryland you know I have a close friend there Bill McGregor at um, Damatha High School. Absolutely. So when you were in high school, did you have a chance to play against Damatha? You know the crazy, the crazy, the crazy uh, story about Damatha was uh, actually it's in Highsville, Maryland. That's really, really where I'm from. So I played at Northwestern High School uh, in Highsville. So we was the public school. Damatha was the private school. So we didn't get an opportunity to play them. But uh, my sing- my junior year, uh, we actually scrimmaged them. And, um, and and Bill McGregor is, was instrumental in you know my recruitment process. He actually was the, the coach in, in our All Star game, uh, the, the Maryland against Virginia team. So you know I've I've actually uh, you know been close with him over the years, and, and he's been a huge influence and a great coach, been a huge influence in my life. Yes, Bill McGregor, I love him. Yeah. So you actually grew up in Hyattsville? Yeah, actually. So Hyattsville, you know Hyattsville, Maryland, the PG County area is connected to D.C. So my high school was in um, P.G. County, actually where Lynn Bias went. A lot of people don't know Lynn Bias actually went to Northwestern High School. Um, but yes, oh. the math in Northwestern is, you know, it literally uh, 10 minutes apart. Okay, yes. I was there a couple years ago. I think um, 2018, when he first returned back there, I was there uh, to visit with him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he actually, uh, the school that I actually uh, sent, uh, the, the first group of uh, kids from uh, Nigeria was actually at St. Francis Academy in Baltimore. And that's where he, uh, you know, when, when he left uh, the Matha, he went to Gilman first. And then that whole coaching staff went over to uh, St. Francis, where I actually had the first group of kids um, from from Africa that, that attended that school yeah, in Baltimore. Yeah, St. Francis, that school itself has such a rich history when it's dealing with African-American students. Because, right, that was the first African-American high school in that area. Absolutely. I think it was the first African-American high school that allowed, I want to say, slaves to uh, be able to go to uh, go to that school. So it was the first school that allowed slaves to go to the school. It has a lot of history. And just ironic, a close friend of mine, he actually got the head coaching job. Um, and I, my first kid uh, that I actually had the opportunity to work with from Nigeria, Sonny Adagwu, who ended up um, going to Miami University of Miami on a scholarship. Uh, he was the first kid that I sent there. So when I first started at St. Francis, it was probably one of the worst programs in the country, not to mention in the in the D.C. area. They, I think they only won like eight games in the last 15 years. And me and the coach, who actually the, the current head coach there now, we was a part of building that program up. And now, you know, a lot of people talk about, I think they rank like number four in the country now. So it was, it was cool to be a part of the beginning of that whole thing. And, and especially, you know, the stuff that I was doing in Africa, 
it actually started the first initial four kids I actually brought to St. Francis. And wow, so I did not know that. I just know about Coach McGregor being there yeah. at St. Francis. You know, I'm curious. When you were younger, what yeah. sports did you play? I actually played bas. I actually played basketball. You know, a lot of people from the the Washington D.C. D.M.V. area, what they call it. Uh, most people, you know, we grew up playing basketball. It's a really big basketball city. Um, and I really didn't think that I would ever be a football player until uh, I remember going on an unofficial visit to the University of Maryland, uh, where I ended up going to college and play football. And I remember going to a basketball game. that was Maryland against um, North Carolina. And when I seen those dudes, how tall they was, um, I realized at that point, if you know, I'm six two, I'm probably not going to grow. It was guards, six seven, six seven, six eight, playing for the University of North Carolina and University of Maryland. I was like, I don't think I'm gonna make it uh, in, in basketball. So I actually, that's that's what made me kind of transition. But I started out as a basketball player, like so many other guys. And so how the old did you area. start to play football? Um, I, I played young. Um, I, I think I started out when I was like 10, um, 10 or 11. I think that's when I started. But, you know, I didn't really take it as serious, um, really, honestly, until my ju- my 10th, 11th grade year high school, because you couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to get a basketball scholarship while I was in high school. So that I, that was my passion, you know, all the way up until probably 11th grade year until we I think we had, yeah, we had a real good year, my junior year, um, semifinals in the state. And then a lot of guys started getting recruited from my high school because we traditionally wasn't a, a, you know, a football school. Um, and, you know, once that happened and guys started getting recruited and next thing I know, I, I started getting offers in football my junior year. So it kind of changed, changed the traje- trajectory of everything that I was doing. I was so thinking. when you were offered from Maryland, were you offered multiple schools or was it just that one, just to go to Maryland. Well, well, I had multiple offers, but what happened? Um, I was I was very lucky, especially when you see the climate of what's going on now. Um, I, I had problems with my SAT, so me struggling on my SAT, you know, school started dropping off like flies back then. You know, it was a it was a different game. It wasn't the whole social media model and everything that's going on now with. You know, it was a lot of fake offers. It was it was kind of like, you know, whatever you got, you got back then. Um, so when people start realizing that I, I was struggling SAT-wise, schools would just back off me. So I had to make a decision if I was going to go to prep school, um, if I was going. I know back in the day, I think it was something called Prop 48, or Prop 44, Prop 48, where you can like, uh, you know, some schools would have let you in without you actually being all the way qualified. So I had like Marshall and, and, and some of those schools that still wanted me to come, but I was I was stuck on University of Maryland. And then actually the head coach now, who's at University of Maryland, he uh, actually came and, and told me that he would hold my scholarship for me if I qualified. So I actually, the crazy story about that was um, when I graduated, I didn't have my score. I was 10 points short and he instructed me to go to the matha it was a guy named Buck Offit. Buck Offit that was there. He was an SAT guru, um, and uh, I actually got my score going to his class that the head coach now at the University of Maryland sent me to. Um, and then I actually I qualified and then came in January. So I had a crazy road to get there, and I was just lucky that um, Coach Loxley and, and and University of Maryland thought highly enough to hold my scholarship yes. for me if I did my part. You know, Ricardo, so, that's. Uh, um, Recently, I realized when I went down to the Bahamas Bowl as a fan, because I started off as a consultant there for two years. And so just this uh, for the 2021 Bowl, I went down as a fan to see my nephew play from the University of Toledo. And it just came to my mind that the first song I've ever heard going to the Bahamas was The World is a Cycle. So it's just like you're mentioning how you had to go back to DeMatha to get to that next level. That's that's just the yeah. way the world is. It is. So when it's you were uh, graduating yeah. college, when you were in college and you graduated, what did you think you were going to do? Oh, man. I think, you know, you know, when you, any, a lot of kids that go play Division One ball, 
I think the first thing you think about, everybody thinks they, they're going to make it to the NFL. Um, and I remember going into, you know, I think we had our first meeting and uh, Coach Friesen, that was the head coach at the time, he put up on the, you know, the, the Jumbotron on the board. I think it was a class of like 20, 20 guys, 23 of us or whatever that came in. Um, and when we all got together for the first time, I think they, you know, my my January class, we I kind of mixed in with the class that came in early, and we was a part of that freshman class. They put up on um, he put up on a jumbotron. Uh, how many kids out of this class is actually going to make it through? And I think it was like two. I think the statistics said two or three of us out of this twenty. Um, 20 class, 20 person class, it was only two of us or three of us that would actually make it all the way through. And I think at that point, I realized that it's not just about the NFL or whatever I was thinking. It was It's more about <laughs> me trying to get a degree, getting out of here. I think that was the first time where I actually thought like, oh, wow, it's not that easy to make it, you know, when you just because you go to a, you know, a quote unquote power five school. Um, so I, I really didn't know, you know, I, you know, I had high aspirations of just wanting to play. I think I was just so excited because it took me so much to, you know, to get in University of Maryland. I just wanted to play. So I really didn't have, I, so you didn't have I didn't know. That's not unusual. <laughs> yeah, that's not unusual. No. And I think a lot, I think a lot of kids, I think a lot of kids don't. Um, and, and I think that's. You know, some of the older guys now, I think it's our job to kind of talk to some of the younger guys that's going in so you can kind of have a plan. And most in, in the plan is not to me, it's not really about, um, you know, the NFL. I think, you know, the schools have an agenda and the agenda is for them, obviously, to win games and, you know, and, and make money for the school. But I think, uh, you know, for the older guys and, and people like us, just, you know, been around the game and understand it. Um, I think it's our job to really, you know, kind of help these kids come up with a plan because most kids, they don't they don't know. Yes. You know how you know, I know you have a relationship with LeVar Arrington. Absolutely. How did that happen? Oh, my God. man! Um, it, it, it's, his story is probably even crazier. Um, I'll keep it. I'll keep it kind of short. So Sean Merriman. um when he came to University of Maryland, uh, I was actually tasked to watch over him when he got to the University of Maryland. Um, Sean came in as probably one of the most highly touted um, guys at that time. Um, he, had, he played at Douglas High School in PG County. And actually, LeVar Arrington's younger brother went to high school with Sean Merriman. So when I was in college, I really didn't have a relationship with LeVar. Um, but you know, through the conversations with Sean, because Sean, LeVar actually helped brand Sean Merriman. So all, all the lights out stuff you see and all, all the stuff you seen with the, you know, the stuff he was doing, doing, been doing with his coat drive over the years. He got a lot of that stuff modeling after what LeVar was doing in the Washington, D.C. area and been able to kind of see what LeVar was doing, um, you know, when he was in high school through his brother. So after I graduated, LeVar actually had a restaurant that was, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, Landover, Maryland, it's like close by where the, uh, where the stadium is in um, in Maryland. And I and I got connected with LeVar and I just really I was like a sponge. I was one happy to be around probably one of my childhood uh, heroes because he was one of the best linebackers that I've ever seen, you know, from Penn State. And then getting a the chance to see him growing up uh, while he was with the Redskins. And I actually was getting the opportunity to see him transition as a businessman. And um, that, that I think that's what kind of drew me to him because I was in the transition period myself. I was trying to figure out what was next for me. And um, so I, I met him at his restaurant and I had the attitude that I'm, I'm not leaving. Like, I just want to be, you know, I want to learn as much as possible. Um, and, and I seen what he was trying to trying to do. He was his biggest thing was helping so many people in the community. And I wanted to be a part of that. And it's crazy, uh, you know, when I first started having real conversations with him, we talk about it to this day. And I think it was like, like, like it's, it's like this. I had this thing in my head about Africa and I didn't even know where it came from. Because when I first met with him, I never even I, I haven't been to Africa yet at the time. 
And I, I remember having conversations with a, with a company and I wanted to take water. It was these water machines that you can, uh, from the condensation, you can basically, uh, you know, service water to communities. So I remember coming to him with these packets, telling him that, you know, I needed help with his, his support to, to take water to Africa. How crazy is that? So that's how our relationship started. And he thought I was kind of crazy at the time. And then, you know, my next conversation was, you know, after I started realizing some of the stuff that I wanted to do in Africa as far as football, um, I told him I wanted to, uh, you know, go to football and teach kids American football. And he he supported me. He was like, look, I don't know everything that you got going on, but I'm doing some football stuff here. If that's what you want to do, I'm going to support you 1,000%. And, you know, I just went and started doing it, started taking it. He created some pads, um, you know, some fundamental pads, and I started taking those pads down to Africa, and I was implementing things that, you know, he was doing in his camps here in the U.S., and I would implement it down in Africa, and then it just it just connected, you know what I mean? Like, the stuff that he was doing and the stuff that I was doing, it just kind of formed, and, you know, we started doing, you know, the camps in London, then Under Armour started getting behind it. So we, we you know, we've been at it for a long period of time, and it just really just started just, with me, just I was determined. I just felt like he was probably one of the smartest uh, guys that I've ever been around for as football players, and he was a huge personality. And he he was one of those people that was approachable. You can you can approach him, you can talk to him, you can touch him. You know, he wasn't too big where he thought that he was better than you just because he was just this huge red skin or huge uh, athlete. So it was kind of cool. Yeah, you know, going back to uh, meeting with Lavar. Would you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Absolutely. Like in the business world? Absolutely. Outside of sport. So what types of businesses have you done? Oh, man. Uh, well, one of the things that I created was uh, a sports concierge company, uh, Continental Consultant. That was like one of the first things that I uh, started out doing. And the reason why, uh, being around Sean Merriman at the height of his career, I was able to you know, be in Miami, be in L.A., be in Vegas, be in places with a superstar. Um, and being around Sean, he used to always tell me, because we was young, you know, we was young at the time when all this stuff was going on. And he used to always tell me, he kind of empowered me in a way, you know, by just saying, hey, man, like anybody that come to me, get their car, like get their car. Whatever you do, wherever I go, just get a car. So I started to collect cards from businesses, people. Um, and once I kind of transitioned, I had so many relationships. So people would call me for everything. And I was like, this gotta be some type of business that I'm, you know, that I'm doing. I, you know, I was, it was natural, but I was like, anybody, any, anytime someone, somebody wanted to go somewhere, they would say, Hey, Cardo, you know, you know, anybody in Vegas? And I just pick up the phone. So I was able to start a concierge company from, all of the contacts that I had, um, you know, and then from there, me and LeVar, we started numerous business. We was, you know, doing it, you know, doing the XP Shields, the extreme precision where we would uh, create body mapping on pads and on shirts. And we would we implemented it during the time of uh, when, the, when the concussion craze was going crazy. We wanted to be the first uh, group in market to kind of help the fundamentals and teaching the fundamentals of, of football. Um I can go on and on about the, the different business, businesses, but I, I just think that's who I am. You know what I mean? I, I'm always I'm a thinker. I'm a creator. I'm a visionary. I mean, you would know being a, being some someone who went overseas. I mean, you got to be different uh, and think outside of the box. So I just think that's that's just all who I am. Whether it's you know creating some or thinking some will work, that's just who I am as a person. Or no box at all. Exactly. So that takes us through that. Whatever that was that caused you to go overseas. So I'm going to um, say to you what I say to most people when they tell me they're going to go overseas and they're going to help people. So I'm going to ask you a question. With mm -hmm. all the athletes that we have in the United States, in every sport possible to play, what would make you leave the United States, cross all those waters, to go to another country and help them. What what put that in you? Um, 
I wanted to be a voice. Um, I think people get so trapped in what's happening around them that they don't think that it's more to the world. So once the first kid, uh, Sonny, who was actually already here playing basketball, and I actually converted him. Once I realized, um, I became a voice for him to make people believe that he can play. And once that happened, I said, you know what? If, if he's here, I can imagine how many other kids like him, one, want the opportunity, two, maybe look like him if given the opportunity. Um, and, and I just, I just, I just felt like the world is so big and it's more to it than just the kids just in your area. I mean, I'm people don't, I don't even talk about the kids that I've helped here in the U S but you know, for me, it was just, I just wanted to do something different and something bigger, um, to kind of leave a legacy. You know what I mean? I, I want people to, to say that, that I had enough guts to, to not only help people here in the U.S., but also just help people around the world. But just be a voice for them. I know people people thought I was crazy. I mean, that, that's, that's, people thought I was nuts. So to go overseas, did how the entry, because, okay, I'll give you an example. When I went to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. my initial entry was through an NFL player, Devon yep. Harley, who's yep. Bahamian. So he then introduced me to government officials and other persons that were playing adults that were yep. playing American football. And then that led to whatever happened there. So what was your entry to go into what country? What was your first country, Nigeria? So, so, so my first country was Nigeria. And my okay. entry point was one of my friends. The way that the whole thing kind of like got in my mind, one of my friends who was a a basketball agent, one of his clients actually was doing basketball camps, excuse me, in Nigeria. So I actually saw the video of the basketball camp. So, you know, he was showing me like a year ago. He's like, hey, man, a year ago, you know, I'm going to show you these, this video. So he pulled out his iPad and he started showing me the video that he, um, of the basketball camp. So I'm looking at the, looking at the basketball camp and I'm like, okay, that's cool. In my mind, I was like, these kids should be playing football. And he looked at me and was like, dude, it'll never happen. They don't play football in America, in Africa. They don't even watch it. And I was like, all right, well, cool. Well, next time, you know, the foundation, you know, the next time you guys do a basketball camp, I want to go. Just let me let me go because I feel like it could be football players um, coming out of this camp than it than better better than the basketball kids that was coming out. So Again, everybody thought I was nuts. The kids don't, don't even watch it. They don't know what, I mean, I'm sure they probably heard of football, but it just wasn't a part. Those kids play soccer and play basketball over in Africa. So it was just an opportunity and, you know, doing it through a foundation, it was a perfect uh, segue because I got a chance to actually watch the kids play and then strategically handpick kids that I can look at and see who I thought they can possibly play. Nigeria. Are there any other countries that you've actually worked with? Yeah, so I actually went to uh, London. Um, I did a camp um, in London um, that was attached to uh, Under Armour. I actually sponsored that camp and um, I actually did a camp in Mexico and Under Armour also sponsored that camp. So those was the two places other than Africa that I went and I was able to play some kids from both of those So Nigeria uh, is the also. only country in Africa so far? Yes. Okay. You know, Mexico, they're really booming when it comes to American tackle football. Absolutely. Um, if you if you pay attention, it's kind of crazy. Uh, even before I um, knew that 
the NFL was actually doing games and stuff there. I mean, I was I was doing it for my, you know, what I wanted to do. And then I started realizing that the NFL, you know, was doing games there and uh, also in London, too. So um, it's a, those two places, uh, that's where the NFL was kind of targeting. You know, the, the football is growing. Um, those people uh, in those countries, they love uh, American football. And it was just an honor to be able to go out there and take Plexico. I think, the, the, you know, um, crazy story about Mexico. Um, I think Plexico may have played in Mexico City. Uh, I forgot which team he was on. It was either uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Giants. They actually had a game in Mexico. And it was like a homecoming for him because the, the, the people – um, in Mexico, remember when he came there. So it was kind of cool for me to have a camp and have Plexico Bears and LeVar there. And it was kind of Okay, dope. you know, before we close, I have to tell you thank you. Thank you so much for wearing our logo today. No problem. So appreciate that. You know, wearing the Building Lives Through Sport Network logo. So in closing, I just want to ask you two more questions. Just tell me the first mm -hmm. thing that comes to mind. When I say building lives. Family. Family is the first thing to come to Okay, so when I say sports network. Probably community. Probably community. Well, you know, I'm just asking you that because Family people ask community. me all the time about the names, building lives through sport network. And honestly, family, community are key and who we're about. So I just have to say thank you so much for joining me. I know we're going to get back together again when you finish the golden ticket and I finish my book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We'll come back together and hopefully hear about the progress of your student athletes. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm just, it was a pleasure being with the, the other person in the world that, uh, care about kids and internationally like I do. So it was a pleasure. Thank and you. Thank You're you very welcome. much.